the Read to Lead podcast, episode 76. Hey everybody, this is Gary Vay, nerd Chuck, author of Jab, 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 Right Hook, and you're about to listen, and listen, I'm gonna say it, the greatest episode of Read to Lead ever by one of my favorite cult fans, Jeff Brown. Better living produces better work, and better work produces better living, and and there's tension there. I don't believe in life-work balance, but I believe in what Dan Miller calls life-work integration, where you take the thing that you do and the life that you live, and they should complement each other. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever-important reading list, but also bring you key insights insights, and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. Now, typically, each week, we sit down with a successful and inspiring business book author, and we're doing that today, but normally, we talk about their latest book and their unique insights on a specific set of areas. Today's guest was with us just a few weeks ago, but he wanted to come back just to answer your question. So today, you get to be in the driver's seat. That guest is Jeff Goins. More on that in just a moment. First, I want to remind you that Jeff's brand new book is out in just a few days. It's about a week or so after this interview is being published, March 24th. Now, if you're hearing this and it's not yet March 24th, then that means that you still have time to get Jeff's book absolutely free. All you have to do is go to artofworkbook.com slash read to lead. That's artofworkbook.com slash read to lead. You can do that through March 23rd, 2015. Our sponsors help offset the cost of keeping this podcast going, and they are Blinkist. Blinkist, inside their free app, serves up business book summaries in both written and audio form. You can try it for three days free and see if either the Plus or Premium subscription works for you. Find out more about it at readtoleadpodcast.com slash Blinkist. And currently, lynda.com is offering to you as a listener to this podcast the opportunity to check out every single course on their site, thousands in fact, absolutely free for 10 days. To find out more about that 10-day free trial, visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash lynda. It was just a few weeks ago when we sat down with Jeff Goins to talk about his new book called The Art of Work, and shortly after that, Jeff reached out and asked if there was anything that he could do just for you. So I polled our newsletter list and our small but thriving Facebook group, and the consensus was to have Jeff back to specifically answer your questions. So, Jeff, thanks, first of all, for agreeing to do that. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. I love the show, and I think we've got some great questions here, so I'm excited to dig in. We'll get to those in a second, but first I have to mention that The Art of Work is currently uh, number 25 out of about, I don't know, 12 million books on Amazon right now. So first of all, congratulations. And and second, how does that happen exactly for a book that hasn't officially been released yet? Yeah, I mean, it just basically means that people are pre-ordering the book uh, in advance. Uh, We've been trying to, you know, be intentional thanks to efforts of uh, your podcast and others um, to build a lot lot of anticipation for um, you know, the, uh, the upcoming, uh, book launch. So it means that, you know, people are ordering the book, uh, before it comes out and then, you know, the books will actually ship, you know, after March 24th. So yeah, that's, it's exciting. It, it means that people are, uh, you know, waiting for it and hopefully I'm doing my job of, you know, letting people know that something cool is coming. Well, that's my only question. Are you ready to get to the, uh, to the listeners questions? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Excited. All right. This first one is from Josh. Hi, Jeff. This is Josh Cook with FamilyFinanceWorks.com. Uh, just curious, what is your strategy around learning and personal development for the year? Thanks. You know, Jeff, somebody the other day asked me what, you know, how I spend my day, and I realized this isn't that question, but <laughs> I, I said, you don't want to know how I spend my day. It's boring. I mean, tell me how you spend your day. <laughs> not, to say that, not to say that your day's boring, but most days are just sort of like, this is what I do, and it's, you know, it's fun and, you know, meaningful to me, but there's lots of just you know, I get up, (laughs) eat breakfast, drink coffee, nothing, you know, super sensational about it. Um, And I think often, you know, we think about things like productivity and success. It's not so much looking at, well, you know, so-and-so does all these things 
just like me. They're just like me. They drink coffee just like me. They eat Cheerios just like me. But, uh, you know, look for like the one or two things that they're doing differently from you. And so, I mean, that's what I'd like to, to talk to. There's a lot of things that in my life are uh, a mess that I wish, you know, weren't that way and certainly things that I'm working on. But in terms of productivity and personal development, uh, you know, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the Read to Lead podcast <laughs> with, you know, without a doubt, the one thing that I feel like I do an okay job of is I read a lot. And I'm a big fan of audiobooks, as I know you are, Jeff. Mm. And so, um, you know, it's hard to read a two or 300 page book if you have to sit down and, you know, chunk through it in, you know, the free minutes of your of your day. Uh, I don't have a lot of those minutes as a dad and as a husband, um, you know, and as as a full time writer and entrepreneur, like I'm. I'm busy. There's always something else to do. And sitting down to read a book, as much as I love reading, sometimes gets, uh, you know, unfortunately deprioritized. Or I wait until I'm going to lie down in bed and I read, you know, a page and a half of a novel or something, and then I pass out. So the way that I get a lot of books read is by using Audible and using the um, the iPhone uh, app. So that, you know, when I'm, when I'm, when I was heading here to my office to chat with you, I had, you know, five, 10 minutes to, to get to where I was going. I listened to, you know, uh, an, an audio book. Um, not the whole thing, but just a fraction of it. And I do that, um, pretty regularly when I'm, you know, washing the dishes or, you know, sometimes getting ready for work or driving somewhere. And all those minutes add up, up to the point that I read a book about every week or every, two, you know, two weeks. Mm. And so, um, I love just consuming a lot of information. I like reading books more than, um, reading blogs and even listening to podcasts, which I hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot here. <laughs> I, I write a blog. I'm on a podcast right now. I have my own podcast. I'm a fan of those, you know, forms of, of media, but uh, I don't think anything teaches you, at least with the kinds of things that I like to learn, um, like, like a book. And one pro tip that I would say that I learned from my friend, David Molnar, who's a successful photographer here in Nashville, is that, um, you can don't listen to it at one X speed where they're sort of talking like this, where they're like, you know, being all dramatic. I listen to audiobooks at three times the speed. Wow. Which you would think would sound like chip monkey, <laughs> but uh, what happens is um, your brain just sort of adjusts. And it, like when I listen to a, an audiobook at regular speed, I'm like, this is slow and boring. Your brain can retain a lot more information than you realize. It's a lot like speed reading, where mm. instead of, um, you know, reading horizontally, you read vertically and you just, your eyes just scan the words. This is, you know, anybody that teaches speed reading will tell you this, your eyes just scan the words. You don't feel like you're reading as we would normally read, but what's happening is your brain is still processing the information and you'll retain about, I can't remember what it is, like 75 to 80% of the content. Same thing's true with, you know, kind of speed reading through, uh, especially a nonfiction book where you're just trying to get through, you know, some of the nuggets. And if you need to slow something down, you can, but listen to them at three X speed and you can basically read three times the amount of books. Um, you know, that you would normally be able to read. That's, I guess, a personal development and a productivity tip and one. Well, so many of my friends and peers listen to podcasts the same way. And, and I always forget about that. I'm always catching myself listening, at pod, listening to podcasts at normal speed and getting 90% of the way through and go, oh, I, I could have got, I could have been done with this 20 minutes right. ago if I just sped it yeah. up. I think there's an audio purist thing in me too that just doesn't let my brain go there. But but sure. but nonetheless, uh, I appreciate that tip. The next question is from from Michael, who represents a, a fairly uh, large group of educators. Hey Jeff, uh, this is Michael Werner from SimpleK12.com and the Ask Simple K12 podcast. Uh, we have a community of about five hundred thousand teachers, Jeff. And one of the most common questions that we get is, while they love teaching and many of them want to stay full-time in the profession, they're looking for uh, side income opportunities, additional income. What suggestions do you have or do some of your authors have for good ways for teachers to explore outside income opportunities? Thanks very much. Love the show. Bye. That question is really for both of us. Uh, I would answer it this way. I don't know if you're familiar, uh, Jeff, with uh, Shane and Jocelyn Sams. They are a couple who Pat Flynn refers to as teachers totally rocking it online. They were on his show back in, uh, I guess it was August. I'll put a link to that in, in the show notes. But they're, they're teaching teachers how, how to do this very thing and have had some success with it themselves. How would you answer that question? One of the ideas that I ran into when I was writing The Art of Work was this this tension between sort of the, the myth of the leap. You know, when we think about 
I'm doing this, but maybe I want to be doing this or, you know, I have a day job, but I'm also passionate about this. There's this pressure to uh, take a leap of faith, right? And we think this is the only way in our culture to transition from what you're doing to what you, you know, in theory, really want to be doing. And uh, I think it's a myth. I think it's, it, at best, it's the exception, not the rule. The rule, and I, I learned this through interviewing countless people who have um, either transitioned uh, or, or kind of built a, a job that they could love. Um, you know, they moved into meaningful work. Um, it was it was not a leap. It was more like building a bridge. And so, you know, basically what that means is that instead of, you know, quitting your job and doing the Jerry Maguire moment where you, you know, like have a big <laughs> speech and then leave and there's no, there's no contingency plan. There's no backup. There's no emergency fund. You're just going after it. This is, this is the ideal. And we think this is what it takes, you know, to do something brave. And I think often bravery is a series of small choices, small steps that get you to where you want to go. And it doesn't, you know, make for, you know, a 90 minute movie on, on the big screen, but most stories of success are really stories of building a bridge. It takes time. It takes a community. It takes a lot of effort on the side. So, I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is don't believe the myth of the leap. Don't believe that you have to like wait and wait and wait and wait and work up a bunch of energy and then finally like run out and jump out into the unknown because, you know, there's one of two outcomes. I don't have to paint the picture of that metaphor for you. There's one of two outcomes with uh, taking a leap. You're going to make it to the other side or you're going to go splat. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to live a splat free life, not just for myself, but also for my family. Uh, you know, so if that, you know, resonates with you, if, you know, you're, you know, maybe not a huge risk taker, uh, you know, there's good news that you can be building your dream on the side. I think this is the way that most dreams, uh, you know, get built. Uh, or maybe, you know, you're like a friend of mine who is a full-time teacher, loves teaching, but it's just not paying the bills, you know? And so how do I take what I'm doing and do something on the side because of the flexibility of, uh, you know, being an educator and, and kind of ma maximize that potential. Now that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of untapped potential here. Again, I'm not an expert here, but if you are a teacher, you have a valuable uh, skill that a lot of people, especially online, and you know this, Jeff, are making a lot of money mm. at, um, you know, Online education, I think, really, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, is um, the sweet spot, you know, for uh, building what we call a lifestyle business. You know, something that um, uh, you can kind of do in your free time and it can make you, you know, as much money as, as you know, you want. Because what do people want? What does everybody want? They want a solution to their problem, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and the reality is um, you have you have the answer to somebody's problem. Derek Siver says that what's obvious to you is amazing to others. There is a group out there, a, mm -hmm. a tribe of people that want what you have because of your expertise and experience. You just have to let them have it and, you know, allow them, you know, to pay you for it. So in the case of my friend, you know, uh, I told him that he should, you know, consider he's a Spanish teacher. And I said, you know, first of all, check with your, you know, school, you know, can you teach Spanish outside of the school and not be, you know, in breach of your contract or mm -hmm. employment agreement? He says, oh yeah, I'm fine. I could, you know, tutor or whatever and get paid on the side. I said, so what if you did that? But what if you scaled your tutoring? Like what if you did Skype tutoring with people all over the country? Like how much time could you do that? Especially, you know, during the summer when you aren't working, uh, you know, what could you do with that? Or what if you, you know, did that for a season, you know, and used a $29 piece of software called Skype call recorder, recorded all these sessions, called them case studies and sold them, you know, for, you know, $97 mm -hmm. along with some, you know, bonus lessons uh, about how to, you know, learn Spanish in three months or something. So I think that there's, um, you know, speaking as somebody who makes a living online teaching stuff, I wish I had a degree in education. <laughs> I wish I under, I'm, I'm reading all these mm. books trying to understand how do people learn. A lot of teachers, sadly underpaid, have this very valuable skill that a lot of people that are less qualified uh, are, are using online to make a ton of money. So you have this, you're sitting on a gold mine. It's just really a, you know, a question of what do I have that other people want? And then how could I make it available? And I, I would begin with, you know, starting a podcast or a blog, build an audience, and then mm. create some sort of higher level offering that people, you know, would pay for. Um, but I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity for educators to, um, you know, build businesses online in the midst of everything else that they're doing. And maybe this is something that you transition into full time, or maybe it's just this really great uh, means of making ends meet or helping you, you know, uh, fulfill some of your financial goals. 
And I, as I'm looking ahead to our next question, Jeff, I realize that uh, Liz Kovart, uh, a former educator, uh, is essentially asking uh, the same thing, you know, turning a passion project uh, in, into a paid career. So we'll skip that question since it's uh, of a similar vein. But I do want to mention that you can find Liz's awesome podcast at BenFranklinsWorld.com. It's fantastic. Wow. Our next question comes from Kent. Hi, this is Kent Sanders from KentSanders.net. I have a question about blogging versus podcasting. In the past, the focus has been on blogging, but with the growing popularity of podcasting, I wonder which is the better medium to help build a platform and reach an audience. If you're someone who's doing blogging or podcasting on the side, in addition to their day job and they're trying to grow their audience, is one medium better than the other? Or does it depend less on the medium and more on the connections the person is making and the value they're bringing to their audience? To add something else into the mix, what do you think of the new trend of audio blogging, which is basically creating a podcast by doing audio versions of written blog posts? This is a way to repurpose your blog content and reach a different audience, but also not have the pressure of producing totally different content for a podcast. So I'm curious to hear your responses to these questions. Sorry for the length of the question, but thanks so much for providing such great content on a weekly basis, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks. In case you don't know, Jeff blogs at goinswriter.com and, of course, also has a podcast, The Portfolio Life. So, Jeff, you're doing both. How would you answer Kent's question? I think it's a great question, Kent, and um, I, I love Kent's stuff. I, I know him. So uh, I was late to the game, you know, mm. uh, and I don't know if you feel that way too, Jeff. I mean, you were not late to the game in the sense that you've been, you know, doing this for uh, what decades, you know, uh, with radio, sure. but you know, with podcasting, I felt like, Oh man, like should have got, should have got in at the you know ground floor. <laughs> and yet, I mean, you've, you know, exploded and getting all these awards and stuff. So it still seems that there's plenty of, plenty of room for people to, you know, start, um, podcasting, mm. but yeah, I, I got into it because I saw other people getting into it and I believe it or not, like talking, and I wanted to give it a whirl because I heard, you know, people like our friend Cliff Ravenscraft just talk about the the math of it. Mm. You know, there's hundreds of millions of blogs and there's hundreds of thousands of podcasts. So just when you think in terms of competition, uh, if you've got a message that you want people to hear, you've got a lot less competition on iTunes. And so, I mean, that's, you know, that's a pretty attractive way to look mm. at it. I don't think it's an either or. Uh, I have a fear and I could be wrong about this. Uh, But I have a fear that people will go gung-ho for the podcast without understanding that, by and large, a podcast is building a platform on rented space. Mm. Now, what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you want to build an audience, uh, you need to build a platform. My friend Michael Hyatt talks a lot lot about this. Uh, Chris Brogan calls this a home base. But you have to have a place where you own your content uh, that you can have all your proprietary stuff in one place. Now, when you are using iTunes or Stitcher, you know, or, or whatever, you know, your form of distribution mm-hmm. is, this is a great way to connect with people, but you don't own iTunes. <laughs> iTunes, does, iTunes doesn't own your content, but you're sort of putting your content on rented space. It doesn't really cost you anything. You just, it's just on there. They're a distribution network. They don't host, you know, the, the audio files, but you are getting access really to their audience, Apple's audience, which is really a bunch of, you know, people's audiences that are all sort of, you know, aggregated in one place. And at any time, Apple could say, we don't like you, Jeff Brown, or we want to charge you $100 <laughs> a minute, you know, to, um, you know, have a, have a podcast on iTunes. At any point, they could change the rules and th- that could really affect your mm-hmm. reach. So if you, you know, if you're doing what uh, a good amount of podcasters do, you've got a website or whatever, and you're hosting on, you know, something like Libsyn, but your main form of connecting with your audience is recording an audio uh, podcast, uploading the file somewhere, and then people going to iTunes and downloading it. I think that is a great form of distribution, a great way to connect with people. But if you aren't ever pushing them back to a website as you're doing, Jeff, and trying to get them on a newsletter or something, you run the risk of someday somebody changing the rules uh, and then you not having access to your audience or just not being able to completely control the conversation. Right now, um, you know, being on iTunes is better than not being on iTunes for sure. And being on Facebook is better than not being on Facebook. Uh, you just want to be careful where you're pitching your tent. As for me, I pitch my tent on my blog. That's where I own everything. That's where I keep all the content. Mm-hmm. But then I use channels of distribution like Facebook, like iTunes, because that's where people are gathering 
but I can't camp, camp out there. You know, if I unroll my sleeping bag and then, you know, somebody comes by and says, Hey, get out of here. Um, you know, you don't live here. You're like, Oh yeah, you're right. I better, I better go back home. I think there are a lot of people that are starting podcasts that are doing great that, you know, basically are traveling from one place to the next with a sleeping bag and don't actually have some place to, you know, pitch their tent, so to speak. Sorry for the elongated metaphor. <laughs> so I think it's, I think ideally it's both. And now a lot of people go, ah, oh, my blog only gets, you know, 25 readers and you know, um, my podcast gets a thousand. Yeah. I would expect that, you know, I would expect that if you're a musician and you're playing a live show at some venue that you own in your hometown, fewer people are probably going to come see you than, you know, if you're playing at Bonnaroo, this, you know, big music festival that, uh, you know, here's in, in, in town in, in Tennessee that you're probably familiar with Jeff, <laughs> but you don't own Bonnaroo. And when Bonnaroo is over, you got to go home. <laughs> and if people don't know where you live and don't know where your, um, you know, your, your proprietary venue is, then you are going to miss a chance to connect with those fans again. And so I think the best thing to do is to do both. And, uh, my friends who have very successful podcasts, who are trying to build businesses online or kind of continue the conversation elsewhere. The smart ones are sending people back to their website, trying to get some people on an email list. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a big drop off. You've got a hundred thousand listeners and maybe 10,000 email subscribers, but I know people that are building seven figure businesses off of these 10,000, you know, email subscribers. Now everybody doesn't need to start a business. And if you just want to, you know, share your ideas, um, then I think that's great. But um, I'm a big fan of owning your platform so that nobody can change the rules on you. And if they do, you still got your core group of, you know, audience members, your tribe that are coming to your website, you know, reading the blog, reading the newsletter. Uh, you know, I love that idea of an audio blog. I've started experimenting with that. Um, I know John Lee Dumas, uh, he started doing that, you know, not just with his entrepreneur on fire interviews, he and, and, and Kate are, you know, doing audio versions of blog posts. Um, I love, I mean, I, I think, you know, we've just sort of scratched the surface on what's possible, you know, with, with media online, but, um, I'm always pretty wary of doing something, putting all my content somewhere, you know, in a, in, in controlling most of the conversation in a community that at any time they can change the rules and I might not have access to my audience. So I want to do whatever I can to protect myself from that without missing out on, you know, a great network like iTunes. So hopefully that's helpful. It is. It's really eye opening. I mean, even for me, uh, I've always been hit or miss with the content that I've created native to my blog and lean heavily on the podcast content. But what you've just shared is just a fantastic argument for being sure you're nurturing that home base. Yeah. And there's gotta be a reason, right? Like if you just go check out my show notes, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, that's fine. And your hardcore fans will do that. Mm. But you know, if you really want to incentivize them, if you want to, I mean, it's hard, right? Like we realize this is hard because you're listening to a podcast, usually like mobile or you're, mm. you're in the middle of work or you're listening, you're running on your iPhone or driving to work. Um, so you're not going to go, Oh yeah, that's a great nugget. I'm going to go you know, read the, the, the show notes and tweet that. Um, <laughs> You know, a, a small percentage of people are going to do that. But if you said, hey, like, you know, thanks for listening to this episode and now go to the go to the website to get, you know, five free copies of Jeff's new book. Uh, I bet you, you know, get some more people to do that. And if you're consistently doing that and finding ways to capture that attention, um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to connect better with your fans. Not everybody, but that's OK. And uh, be able to continue the conversation, which I think is is important, regardless of whether or not you want to monetize it or not. If you submitted a question, it may be coming up here in just a few minutes. First, though, I want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. And currently, they're offering a free 10-day trial. To find out more about that, you can visit readtoleadpodcast.com slash lynda. Whether you're a problem solver, curious, or the kind of person who wants to make things happen, check out lynda.com for courses like growth hacking fundamentals, bootstrapping your business, learning to be assertive, viral marketing, and getting things done. And one of the cool things about lynda.com, at least I think anyway, is you can learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat Rate. To get that 10-day free trial, remember readtoleadpodcast.com slash Linda. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash Linda. Well, Jeff, our next question comes from Marcus Cousy, committed, uh, committed uh, uh, submitted on the uh, Facebook group page. Marcus blogs at ourpeacefulfamily.com, and he wants to know, 
How do you decide what to say no to, especially considering how busy you appear to be? So I'm, I'm not sure if Marcus is suggesting you're not saying no to enough things or what. <laughs> yeah, he's probably right. Oh, my goodness. I was just talking to a friend about this today where um, she was sort of um, telling me this project that she was working on, all the things that she wasn't doing. And uh, I said, look, like, I totally get this. Um, and, and in fact, I don't, I don't want you to apologize to me because, you know, I was trying to hold her accountable to this you know, project that she was working on. Uh, don't think that I'm somebody, you know, who's coming to you, you know, with the, you know, the, the teacher's ruler and I'm going to, you know, set you mm-hmm. straight. I get it. Most of the time my life looks like a mess and it, it <laughs> appears that way because it is that way. But what I do know is that when I'm able to do something that people notice, which is not all the time, or when I'm able to succeed, which is not all the time or even most of the time. Uh, but when I do something uh, big, it's really the result of a bunch of little things that I try to do every day that sometimes fail and sometimes accumulate into something that actually works and actually takes off. Mm-hmm. The problem is, you know, going back to this idea of a leap, we think that it's all or nothing, you know, it's all about, I'm just going to go after it. You know, and I talk to people that, um, you know, do big things. I was talking to, to this couple not too long ago when I was, you know, writing this book, The Art of Work. And uh, they moved to Burundi, the second poorest country in the world, to start a coffee company called Long Miles Coffee Project. They said they took a leap. I said, how did you get here? Well, we moved our family to this very poor French-speaking country to start a coffee company, which we had never done before. It was like taking a leap. I said, how long did that leap take? They said, 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that doesn't sound like a leap to me. Like that sounds like a slow motion movie, you know, like that's a long time, but this is the way life works. You know, there are these big moments and then there's all these little moments in between. And those little moments in between are called life. It's called like the way we live most of our lives. And I think it's beautiful. I think there's really good stuff um, in there. So I know the question is about saying no to things, but the way that you say no to things uh, is not by necessarily accumulating some, you know, superhuman discipline. Now that's great. I know people that have superhuman discipline and I know people that are amazingly productive and, you know, are never late to a meeting and, you know, their house is always clean and, and they never feel stressed. And I watch those people, I learn from them and then I hate them because (laughs) it's, because I can't relate to that. And I'm not saying that it's, it's bad to want to be productive. There are some things in my life that I wish weren't so, but I share that to say, you don't have to get all your stuff figured out before you, before you can then go do something that matters. Most of us, and this is what I told my friend, have to find little margins of time to do the one or two things that we absolutely have to do that are essential every day that are going to move the needle or, you know, move the ball down the field, whatever, you know, metaphor you, you choose. Uh, and that's the way change happens. So what do I say no to? Well, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say yes to a lot of things right now because I'm launching a book and every opportunity to do an interview or talk to somebody or meet with somebody could mean that I could, you know, share this message with a book and maybe sell one more book. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting to me because there's a limited window Mm -hmm. of opportunity to get people to care about a new book before it's no longer new and nobody cares about it, Mm -hmm. right? Like we care about new things and we don't necessarily care about old things that, you know, didn't really succeed. So I'm saying yes to a lot of things. The things that I say no to are the things that I know absolutely are going to interfere with my one thing that I do every day. And, and for me, it's a list. So I don't try to maximize the productivity of every minute of every day. I wish I, I wish I could do that. Like that's a, that's a goal. I'm not poo pooing that, but I'm also saying that if you can relate to my mess and frazzledness, there's still an opportunity to do great stuff. And really it comes down to doing one big thing every day. Um, so that's that's sort of how I organize my schedule. What's the one thing that I absolutely have to do today that if nothing else gets done, I will at least do this and I will and I, I will be okay. I will still be in business. I will, you know, still be um, you know, able to grow, you know, personally, whatever that might be. And when you have more than one goal, you basically have no goals. Um, uh, Greg McEwen, I think that's how you say his name, mm-hmm. uh, wrote in his book Essentialism that until recently, the word priorities did not exist because the word prior means one, you know, primary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you can't have more than one priority. So when we say, oh, I've got, like priority means one thing. Uh, so when you say, I've got lots of one things. What? <laughs> I've got three one things? No, you have one one thing. So what is your one thing that you're going to do today? And then how do you orient everything else around, around your schedule? So do I say yes to things that I sh- sometimes should not say yes to? Absolutely. Uh, but I have one thing 
that I'm supposed to do every day. And then there's kind of like a weekly one thing. Uh, and then there's uh, typically a monthly one thing, a quarterly one thing and a yearly uh, one thing. When you start looking at every opportunity and every ask and every, you know, thing that comes your way through the filter of does this align with the one thing that I need to do? Um, it helps you say no to things and it helps you realize, oh, I can't say yes to that. But I say no to things that interfere with my ability to do that one thing. Well, this next question comes, Jeff, from Brett. Hey, Jeff, this is Brett Perry from CrossCulturalPros.com, where I host the Cross Cultural Pros podcast. I have a question in relation to your concept of the portfolio career, which I think is a good one. Many of those in my field of business coaching maintain other ways of earning income outside of their activities. Uh, so do you feel it's more advantageous to have two or more of your focus areas closely related, for example, accounting and tax preparation? Or should people be looking wider afield in their skill set, such as perhaps teaching an instrument on one hand and business coaching on the other? One might argue the latter kind of spreads the risk. Interesting to hear your thoughts and congratulations again on the book. There's lots of different schools of thought on this. I mean, some people would say, do your one thing and just be amazing at it. My approach and experience has always been, and this is coming from a frankly more artistic perspective. I'm a creative person. I get bored doing the same thing over and over again. As much as I love writing, I kind of like uh, you know, doing podcasting and blogging and speaking and consulting and coaching. Uh, and I think you can spread yourself too thin, but I like the variety of, you know, what's called a portfolio life. This idea that your work is not just one, you know, singular activity. It's really a portfolio of activities. Now the tension there is some people hear that and go, great. That means I can do all these things that I want to do and never really commit to mastering any of them. And I don't think that's true. Mm. I think that you don't want to become a jack of all trades, but rather you want to be a master of some. Robert Greene, the author of a book called Mastery, says that the future belongs to people who take a few skills and combine them in interesting ways. That's a paraphrase. And I think I probably have recommended that book on one of our shows before. <laughs> I, it's a great, it's a great book if you if you're trying to consider like what, what does it look like to be great at something? Not just good, but great at something. Uh, anyway, this idea of a portfolio life is taking a bunch of different things and I break it down into uh, several different categories from, you know, work to, uh, you know, uh, family and home life mm -hmm. to your hobbies and uh, avocations. And then kind of like, you know, purpose, like your deeper p purpose. What, what, are, what are you living for other than yourself? So, uh, you know, those are four different areas that, that I think about when you think about a, a portfolio. And so for me, you know, the things that I undertake have to sort of fit into one of those four buckets and they can't. Uh, take away from one of them. I believe that better living produces better work and better work produces better living. And, and there's there's tension there. I don't believe in life-work balance, but I believe in what Dan Miller calls life-work integration, where you take the thing that you do and the life that you live and they should complement each other. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife is a part of my business decisions, even though she doesn't, you know, technically, you know, she's not an owner of, of the business. I own the business. I run the business, but she's an advisor because I know that when I do stuff and don't talk to her about it, sometimes it crashes and burns and, and she's got a lot of, you know, wisdom. And so, uh, and I also just don't like that feeling of there's work and there's family and they don't intersect. Now at times they can compete, you know, and we all kind of struggle with that and deal with that, I'm sure. Mm. So when you're undertaking new things, you're really asking the question, if I've got a passion or an interest, where does it fit, you know, in this whole framework? I don't think they have to be closely related. Again, that's my perspective, but it's based on this idea that you're not just one thing, that you are many different things. You're a multifaceted person. I love making homemade guacamole and I also love playing mm. the guitar and I also love writing and running a business. And I think all of those different things sort of complement each other in some interesting and unique ways that create a portfolio. What I would say is this though, when you tell people what you do, it still needs to be like one thing. It still needs to be the portfolio. So when you describe what you do, you could say, you know, I'm, I'm a podcaster who also, you know, helps people build websites or, you know, I have, um, you know, I have 20 years of experience uh, in radio and I use that experience, not just in being on air, being an, you know, an on air personality, but also running and managing a team and, you know, working with technology. I use those skills and I combine them into a portfolio that includes, um, sharing my ideas with the world, uh, helping encourage and inspire people to learn and read and, and also helping people get their messages heard through, you know, building websites and mobile apps. That makes sense to me. There's integration there. 
Mm. They're, they look like they could be one-offs, but I go, that makes total sense to me that you would do that, Jeff, because mm. you have, uh, you know, experience. Maybe it doesn't make sense to people who are sort of watching externally, but, you know, I, knowing you, I understand, you know, the, the lessons and experience that you've accumulated that in many ways has prepared you, you know, for that kind of work. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if you're asking yourself, where does this fit? You can't just say, do I love this? Because I think there are three questions that you have to ask if it's going to become a part of your portfolio. Part of the work that you do is, do I love this? Mm. Am I good at it? And uh, is there a need for this? So when we when we ask, is there a need for it, uh, but I'm not good at it, that's, that's not going to work, right? Because you're going to bite off more that you can chew. And <laughs> if we say, here's what I love, uh, but there's no need for it. And you might even be good at it. Well, that's a, that's a hobby, you know? So you really have to ask those three questions uh, in order to, you know, understand what's called that sweet spot. And I've heard lots of different people talk about this. Mm. Uh, Michael Hyatt's talked about this. Scott Belsky's talked about it. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is an old idea. I've heard it a lot of different ways, but those three questions I think are, are necessary to understand. Is this something that's just a thing that I do on the side or is, is this something that I'm going to call uh, my work. It's okay to have hobbies. I think play, uh, you know, as psychologists would call it, not like, you know, playing with toys. Oh, that's, that's a lot of my play time with my son, Aiden. Mm. Uh, but doing stuff for fun is necessary to your mental health, but it's not your work. It's not a part of your work. That really needs to satisfy those, those three criteria. And those can be as, you know, alike or different as you want, as long as there's some sort of theme that you can weave through that. And, um, you know, that takes a little bit of, you know, branding savviness. But um, the good news is that it feels weird right now to say, I, I don't just do one thing. I'm not just a plumber or just a writer or just a podcaster uh, because we still kind of live in this industrial mindset. That, like you go to the factory and you, you know, work whatever, 80 hours a week doing this one thing and you're part of assembly line and then you go home and then you live the rest of your life and there's there's no connection. You hate the job or, you know, you do it as a means of, you know, making a living, but the life and the work are very separate. Mm. That's not that's not the direction in which our world is going. Organizations are getting smaller. Forbes just had a study come out recently about um, you know how uh, by I may have mentioned this before by 2030 half of the workforce is going to be freelance. Yeah. You're going to have to be not a jack of all trades but a master of some very very soon. And so if you're thinking about this right now, you're thinking about how do you build your portfolio. Well, you're ahead of the game, and that's really good news. Yeah, you mentioned that stat to somebody just this morning. It's crazy. It, it, it is. It is. Well, next question comes, uh, Jeff, from Jeff Sanders. Hey, this is Jeff Sanders from jeffsanders.com. A lot of Jeffs here. Anyway, uh, so Jeff Goins, question for you. I am building a business that I love, and I'm really excited about it, and I feel as though it is either part of my calling or possibly my calling in life, but I have this question in the back of my mind, which is what if? You know, what if there's something better out there? What if... I meant to be doing something that's not what I'm currently doing. Will that feeling never go away? Will that question always lurk in the back of my mind for the rest of my life? Or is there a way to feel like, yes, I've hit the nail on the head. This is what I meant to do. Here it is. So any help on that would be fantastic. Thanks a lot, Jeff and Jeff. Talk to you soon. You will hit the nail on the head one minute before you die. <laughs> so you have that to look forward to. <laughs> Until then, you have to live in the tension that we all live in, which is there can always be more. There can always be more opportunity, more money, more stuff to do. And that doesn't mean it's bad. There are voices in this world that tell you, just shut up. Like, just <laughs> deal with it. Just submit to your life and be happy. Now, the reality is, you know, to get kind of scientific on it, you are your happiest when you are doing difficult stuff, which requires some novelty, mm -hmm. like I worked a job that I liked, I loved, that was difficult, challenging. And so every day was a new challenge for me to, I had to read uh, hundreds of books, literally, to uh, figure out how to do this job that I did for a nonprofit as a marketing director for seven years. Uh, every week I was reading a new book that my boss was throwing to me because I had a degree in Spanish and he had his MBA. And I, I had a conversation with, with somebody at one point. I said, I'm going to get my MBA. I said, oh, great. In what? <laughs> so that tells you how much business savviness I have uh, to, you know, I thought MBA was like code for just like master's degree. I didn't understand that the, the B and the A were you know, like a part of the business part. <laughs> anyway, so he was always throwing books at me because I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about business or marketing. And I was absorbing all this stuff, learning it. And I was thriving. And then I got to this point where 
I was doing a good job. There wasn't a lot left to learn. And I knew I had security and I could probably work there for the next 10, 15 years without ever getting fired. And that scared me. And I started thinking more and more about um, what if I'm missing out on something? So I think you listen to that voice. You know, I think it's good to pay attention to. Now, the tension is more often than not, we need to commit to a certain job or work for a season. And a season is not three months, you know, a season of life. I'm talking about two to three years. In my case, it was seven years. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's where you learn and accumulate valuable skills. If you're going from one thing to the next, the next, the next, you're doing, you know, a series of internships and, you know, I don't know what, what your interning experience, you know, has been or was, but most people that I know, most college students that are, you know, interning somewhere, it means they're fetching coffee (laughs) and, uh, and sitting in meetings. Mm. But, you know, if we go back to kind of the way people used to learn a trade, through apprenticeship, through sitting under somebody, a master, and learning how they did what they they do, uh, you were usually doing stuff that you didn't want to do, but you were learning the skill that eventually you could go practice. That process lasted 10 years, seven years of sitting under the master, and then two to three years of going out and being what was called a journeyman and doing it. And then you had to submit a master work, a masterpiece to the guild to become a master. So that was a hard process. And I think that we believe in this myth of, I just need to be okay and I just need to be happy. Um, if you are doing work that is not challenging, uh, you will not be happy. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talks about this uh, in a great TED talk and also a book called Flow, where he says that basically we are our happiest. And he learned this from you know growing up uh, in the, uh, you know, during World War II and seeing, you know, sort of the, um, the depth of human depravity, you know, seeing people lose a reason to live. And he grew up in this and, you know, very early on was aware of what does it take for somebody to, uh, like make sense of their life and not, uh, you know, die of, uh, depression or suicide or, um, just give up hope. And he, he realized that what it takes to be, you know, quote unquote happy to feel like your life matters is it's a tension between competency and challenge. Mm. If you're too good at something, you're bored. And if it's too hard, you're anxious. I've had jobs where I said, yep, I can do that. Pay me money. And I didn't have any competency and it was too hard and it created a lot of stress. And then I've had jobs like I did, like, like eventually my marketing director job became that eventually became too easy, that there was no longer the, the challenge there that I needed to, to feel like I was uh, alive. And, um, you know, and, and I was, you know, bored. Uh, and so if you want to be happy, you want to look at your work and go, does this matter? It needs to fit in that, that flow intersection of it's challenging, meaning at times I don't know how I'm going to pull this off. But I feel, I sense, I know that I have enough experience that I can figure it out. Uh, now, that said, we all, we all uh, think about, you know, the next best thing. And I think that's okay because that means you're still living. That means there's still more to accomplish. I talked to a friend recently and he said, what if my calling, my life's purpose was to just have my daughters and everything after this is gravy? I go, dude, how does that make you feel? Like, I, 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 as a parent, like that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like somebody asked me recently, what are you most proud of? I said, my son, totally my son, <laughs> but that's not what you really wanted to know. You wanted to know something else. So I'll tell you what I'm, I'm second most proud of, <laughs> uh, you know, because that's, you know, of course that's obvious. Uh, but does that mean that you're done once you become a parent? Does that mean you're done once you win the Nobel prize? Does that mean you're done once you have some incredible achievement? I sure hope not. I sure hope that I'm not coasting downhill for the rest of my life, that there is this challenge and a competency to meet it. That doesn't mean my next thing is going to be as popular or as quote unquote successful as my previous one, but that doesn't even really matter. It just means that I'm going to continue to find new challenges and continue to grow in my skills so that my competency can meet those challenges. And if you're not feeling that right now, I'd encourage you to step into those. But sometimes the challenge is to stick with it a little bit longer. You know, as I learned in the case of my, what what ended up being a seven year apprenticeship, although I didn't realize it at the time. Well, Jeff, we have just a couple of more questions. And as I look ahead to both of these, I think uh, in, in other answers you've given, you, you've touched on both of these questions, but, but okay. I'll ask him to see if there's anything that you would like to add. Uh, Ken Zimmerman Jr. Uh, blogs at KenZimmermanJr.com, and he asks, is your calling something that changes over time or, or does it remain the same? This is such a, like I hear this question all the time. Not that I'm like some expert, but um, I sure learned some things when I was interviewing all these people and reading all these biographies, writing this book, The Art of Work. One of the things I learned was this, your calling does not change, but it evolves, right? And a lot of people think that's, um, you know, uh, 
like I want to do this thing, but then I did, did something else and you know, it, it changed, right? Like I, like, you know, that, that the, the universe or God, or, you know, I, you know, my own self-awareness, it, it changed. Mm. And, and something about that feels sort of like flaky to me. Like maybe you just like got bored or maybe <laughs> you don't really understand, um, you know, your past and how it's connecting to your present. I think, you know, as we mature and grow, certainly things change and our priorities shift. Uh, but when I look at lives of significance, like um, a Mother Teresa or Walt Disney or some of the people that I interviewed, you know, in the book, the calling would evolve. And what the way that they looked at their lives was as a as a not one single piece of work, but as a body of work. And I, I think of that as you know this this magnum opus. On a previous show, Jeff, we talked about uh, Mr. Holland's opus and how his opus wasn't that symphony that he you know, who's creating and he thought was his life's work. It was the life that he was living. So if you think of a calling as a job, then yeah, it's going to change. If you think of a calling as the life that you're living and understanding the deeper purpose that hopefully is woven throughout all the different seasons of life, uh, I don't think it'll change. But I think as you grow and mature you will better understand it. Mm. And I love the story of Mother Teresa because, you know, here's a woman who was, you know, called to be a nun, you know, and, and kind of the like oldest school definition of calling. She was called to this vocation of, you know, serving in, in full-time ministry as a nun. One day uh, when she was going on like a sabbatical, she was riding on the train and she just felt overcome with this feeling that she needed to go serve the poor. She needed to go live with them. So what, what that initiated was this um, process that took a couple of years. Basically, she pivoted from one path to another, to being a nun, and, and she was a teacher, to uh, living in poverty, uh, getting rid of you know the habit that nuns wear and wearing a sari, you know, becoming uh, one of and identifying with the poor and starting her organization, um, the Missionaries of Charity, uh, which you know became a recognized order by the Catholic Church. She could have just said, well, I was called to be a nun and I'm not going to do that. And the world, I mean, I, I hope that you don't disagree with this. The world would have missed out on a lot if Mother Teresa didn't change her understanding of her calling and make that pivot. I would argue that all the pivots and twists and turns that life throws at us and, and you know, our greater understanding of what it is that we do and what we're supposed to do, because we'll get more and more, you know, deeper understanding as we mature, I hope. Mm. Uh, that all of those things are part of the journey that I think of as your calling. Excellent. Uh, one more from from Joseph Berman. He uh, blogs at podtopod.com. He does a newsletter just for podcasters. And this came in from the uh, Facebook group, which you can take part in if you'd like at readtoleadpodcast.com slash group. And Jeff, his question, in this era where change is the norm, is there such a thing as stability? And if so, how can we achieve it? I hope so. I mean, I, I hope I, I'm not painting myself as this guy who thinks should, everybody should go quit their jobs. Um, you know, I work for myself and you can probably relate to this too, Jeff. Man, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to run a business. It's not something that most people are cut out to do. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, if it were, then we would have no organizations that were larger than, you know, one person. We would have no, uh, you know, cafes or uh, restaurants or Walmarts or anything that was, you know, that required more than one person to run it. And that would not be good. And that would be very, a very inefficient world to live in. Uh, so I think often the answer is this is hard. I need to stick with it just a little bit longer. I'm a big fan of commitment. I think when in doubt commit, when you don't know what to do, stick with where you are a little bit longer. I know so many friends who have jumped ship from their day jobs only to, you know, go bankrupt six months later and then go work at Starbucks or something. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with working at Starbucks. I have a friend who works at Starbucks corporate, uh, loves it. But, um, you know, a lot of times we get sort of consumed with the dream and really we're just being impatient and immature. I think a calling, your life's work, this thing that you're meant to do, it will take time. It will take patience. And the surprising uh, secret to really being great at what you do is living a life that wherever you are, you are um, as Jim Elliott put it, fully there, wherever you are, be all there. And, and along the way, you are collecting lessons that life has to teach you. You are participating in your own self-education, uh, you know, being that apprentice uh, where your teacher is all the people around you, all the, ex all the experiences, even, you know, the, the jobs that you hate, using that to prepare yourself 
uh, for the work that you're going to one day do, understanding that even now you're contributing to, you know, that, that life's work, uh, that magnum opus that isn't just one thing, but really, you know, your entire uh, body of work. So I hope that's, um, that I'm not saying just, you know, kind of jump ship because often uh, the things that we're doing without our even understanding it are preparing us for what's to come. But there do- does come a moment in your life and I think it's better to wait on that than, you know, jump prematurely when it's clear that it's time for me to take a pivot in the road and everything that's happened before is valuable and preparing me and it's not wasted, uh, but it's time to take a significant turn and start heading in, you know, a different direction. For me, that process took seven years. It doesn't have to take that long, <laughs> but it might and it's okay and it's a good road to walk. And, uh, you know, it, it may at times feel sort of frustrating and you may feel restless, but there are lessons to learn in that too. I mean, I read a study that said 87% of the world's workers, this was a Gallup poll a few years ago, um, are not engaged at work, meaning they either hate their jobs or they're just sort of like, nah, you know, I'm just doing it. And I don't think 87% of the world's workers need to go quit their jobs. They need to make a pivot within the existing organizations. They need to go do something else for somewhere else. Uh, or uh, they need to learn how to be satisfied in the work that they're doing by you know, embracing this, this concept of flow where you find a new challenge or try to you know, improve your skills and competency that you can do the work a little bit better. But that idea, 87% of people are not engaged with their jobs. That's a problem. And, and the problem is not the world of work necessarily. The problem is us and we're going to have to, um, you know, figure out what we want to contribute to the world before we find out what we're meant to do. Well, Jeff's new book officially releases on March 24th and you can get it for essentially for free right now. You just pay shipping through March 23rd. Uh, You can get that at artofworkbook.com slash read to lead. That's artofworkbook.com slash read read to lead. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time again to speak to us. We really appreciate you being here and congratulations on the success of the book so far. That's fantastic. Thanks, Jeff. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and yeah, I hope this is helpful to everybody. Thanks for having me. I sure hope you enjoyed this special listeners questions episode with Jeff Goins. You can find out more about Jeff at the read to lead podcast.com website. We've linked to his blog there. Also his podcast, many of the resources that Jeff mentioned as well, along with all the websites from those who submitted questions today. Check those out at read to lead podcast.com slash zero seven six for episode 76. And as this episode publishes, we're just a few days away from wrapping up voting in the 10th annual podcast awards. The Read to Lead podcast is nominated for Best Business Podcast. You can go to podcastawards.com and vote for your favorites through March 24th. And in the business category, we hope you'll give a nod to the Read to Lead podcast. And finally, I want to thank Jimmy and Jeff, who both left five-star ratings and reviews in iTunes of the Read to Lead podcast. You can do the same, readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes or readtoleadpodcast.com slash Stitcher. Well, that's going to do it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.